Nimda, welcome to the Underground Society podcast. How are you? Hello, I'm good. I'm super excited to have you here. We were talking a little before this about you binging a bunch of our content before yeah. going into this interview. So thank you. I, I appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> no, I love I love podcasts. And there's like no podcast that kind of exists in like the underground kind of electronic scene. So it's like nice because it makes me feel less alone with all the struggles that I get. A few years back, I don't actually know exactly when this happened, but you lost one of your best friends to suicide. 2020 was the worst year of my life by a million miles. What timing? You're like going through yeah. grieving and you can't even go out and do anything. I remember just thinking like, oh, if, if Sam was here, he would just be taking the piss out of this. He'd be like going into shops and pretending to cough and stuff. <laughs> and like, he was like super, just that guy who was like super loud and had no filler. If you could talk to him right now and you had one thing you were able to say to him, what would that one thing be? My producer tag is here, so I'd probably just be like, you know, I've played your stupid voice note to like a crowd of like 5k people. That's so cool. That's a great way to keep someone's spirit alive. Live. Nimda, welcome to the Underground Society podcast. How are you? Hello, I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm super excited to have you here. Uh, we were talking a little bit before this about you binging a bunch of our content before yeah. going into this interview. So thank you. Start off this interview by saying thank you for doing that. Oh. I, I appreciate you, your your enthusiasm going into this conversation because a lot of people don't have that same level of enthusiasm. So I appreciate it. <laughs> no, I love, I love podcasts. And no, I, I, I was saying to you like a couple of weeks ago or whenever we started speaking that there's like no podcast that kind of exists in like the underground kind of electronic scene not that i know of anyway not in this format so it's like nice because it's it makes me feel less alone with all the struggles that i get <laughs> with this kind yeah of for life. real but that's that's why uh primarily why we're why we're doing this is just you know so that people can see the human side and the struggles of you know what this industry actually consists of. So to kind of start us off, I like to get people's backgrounds. I know you started at going to school well, a little after you started producing, but you went to school at the same school that Zomboy went to. So I went to school and then I went straight to college from school. And uh, yeah, he went to, I went to a place called ACM, which is like a production or I don't think it's just production. I think it's like any kind of music like path you want to take, you can go there and study it. But I did like a production course and oh, all the teachers just like constantly went on about how Zomboy went there. Cause like I was in the, <laughs> like, I was on like the production uh, course. So uh, there was a lot of producers and like, there wasn't many dubstep producers, but like whenever there was a dubstep producer, it was like, oh yeah, Zomboy went here. But <laughs> I, I actually spoke, I went to Base Paradise uh, in Budapest like a month ago. I don't even remember when it was now, but. I actually spoke to him there and I, t I asked him about it. He was like, yeah, I went there for like a couple months and dropped out or some, sh or I think that's what he said, but I was like laughing because they just, they, they also like flexed that like Ed Sheeran went there and stuff, but what the heck? I think he went for like three days or something. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I think if you, if you spent even an hour out of school, we're going to use it as marketing. <laughs> yeah, literally. I think, yeah, it's, it wasn't that great of a place, honestly, but Okay. Yeah, I was going to yeah. ask, how was your experience going to school there? Uh, so I did a diploma there. The first year was good in terms of I enjoyed it. A lot of what they were teaching, without like sounding like a dick, like was stuff that I had already knew because I've produced since I was like 10 years old. And it was like how to use an LFO or like this is how you uh, EQ something. And I was like, yeah, this is just boring because uh, we'd uh we used ableton there and they'd be like okay today you're gonna make a saw wave and you're gonna put an lfo on it i was like i i can do this in 10 seconds um, yeah i don't need to spend an entire like quarter on this one thing <laughs> yeah so i actually uh i did my first year got i don't think i even not got that good of a grade because i was just so like not applying myself to it and then in the second year, it was like a two year course. And then in the second year, I dropped out because I was just like, I'm just going to go work. Because uh, I felt like I just didn't care about the, because it was like the first year you get a diploma, the second year you get extended diploma. And I just didn't care. It wasn't, the diploma wasn't going to get me anything anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. when you're competing, I've actually, no, oh, obviously I'm from the United States. So that's probably a big reason why, but I've actually never heard of that school. So I mm. would imagine with the competition with, you know, 
the United States schooling systems and, you know, with ICON and SAE and the schooling that we have over here. Is there, is there any other like better college for music where, where you're from? Uh, I don't know all of them. I think okay. there's a place called Point Blank in London. I might be wrong. I think there's BIM, which is like the same thing. I don't know though, because I haven't been to them or heard or known anyone who goes to them, but I think they're all roughly the same thing. They're like just really the, the very basics of, of kind of the industry, depending what course you take, like the industry or how to produce really basic stuff. But I feel like that's like any college though. Like you really don't get exp- like real world experience of like what you're actually going to be using every day. Like some stuff you're probably going to take away. But I think college and schooling, what I've realized at least is like, they're there to teach you the basic knowledge so that when you go into the workforce, you're still going to have job training and everything for whatever company that you're wanting to work for in the normal workforce. I'm just relating the music industry to this, but that, you know, you're going to have normal job training in a traditional place. So they don't really need to teach you like the in-depth stuff because your company, whatever company you're going to work for is going to teach you that. But in the music industry, it's like you have so, you know, with all the resources you have with music or with YouTube, with, you know, uh, Patreon, you know, other producers doing courses and stuff, all that kind of stuff. H- have you done any of the other type of educational type stuff or have you kind of just trial and error for yourself? No, I, I finished school, uh, literally like scraped my way through school, got like terrible grades. Well, actually, I, I got terrible grades. I got an, I got an A star in music. That was it. And I think I did, I got like a B in graphic design or something. Uh, and then went straight to college, which was basically an excuse not to carry on with normal education. And then just, yeah, went into the working life, started working on like construction sites. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask before you started really getting a name for yourself in the, the music industry, what were you doing financially? Oh, I've had loads of random jobs. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I think while I was at college, I worked behind a bar, uh, but it was stupid because I wasn't old enough to serve alcohol. So mm. I was just like, a bar can. getting yeah. people shit. <laughs> and then like cleaning glasses. Then I worked on construction sites for a bit. And then I worked at laser tag, which was a really long, tedious job, but it was like probably the most fun job I had because I was so good friends with everyone there. And then oh, over lockdown, I did like delivery driving stuff for a bit. And then I, when lockdown stopped, I went back to the arcade, the laser tag place. And then I think I quit my job and did music full time, like 2021 20, October. I have no backup plan. If I like fall off or something or get canceled for some shit, I'm like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do because <laughs> I like all the jobs I've had, I have been like, I've known someone who's known someone who's like, this company needs someone to do this job. So I'll be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah I feel like those jobs are fairly easy to come. Everyone has a job. Everyone knows somebody. It's just like putting your feelers out there and trying to find something if something does go wrong. But with your success, hopefully that doesn't happen. We'll talk about in a second, but you, you, even with the, you know, the collab coming out with Kaiwachi and some of the big moves you've been making is really really setting you on the trajectory of, uh, in my opinion, becoming one of, you know, a young superstar in the tear out and bass music scene. So what kind of first perked your interest in producing and electronic music and stuff? Because like you said, you started at such a young age. This is like a rabbit hole story, but okay. <laughs> I was 10 or 11 years old. I'm now 23. There's like, every time someone asks me this, I, I feel like I tell a different story, but it's like three main things that happen. One of them was when we were in music class at school, we learned how to use GarageBand on the school computers. And it was like, oh, make a rock song out of MIDI drums and MIDI guitar. And I was like, oh, what's this, uh, what's this synth folder mean? And I was like, found out about synths. Drag and drop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And that all within the same year, I learned how to use a DAW, uh, well, a really basic one. And someone played me Nero Crush on You. And I was like, what is this? It was either Nero Crush on You or Bar 9 Piano Tune or like something by Skrillex, probably. It was one one of those like classic tunes. And in the same year, I went to like a local festival where I live. I live in a place called Guildford, which you had a Mad Dubs on. He lives 10 minutes from me down the road. Uh, And I think Zombo used to live here as well. But there was this like really shit local festival called Gilfest and it was like I think the headliner was like Ollie Murs or like okay. <laughs> Rihanna or someone but then there was 
That was almost like the Coachella almost. Oh, no. Not quite it's that like stature, but. Maybe like 20,000 cap. Like it was a tiny field. Let me, let me like, rephrase that. The amount of different genres, yeah. at, at least, well, is kind of similar it, to that. It wasn't like an electronic festival at all. It was right. just, just like. It was normal. Like, they'd get one big headliner and then they'd get loads of like local bands and stuff. But there was this one tent like right in the corner called the Rave Tent. And I remember being at this like festival with my family at the age of 10 or 11, however old I was, wandering in this t- into this tent with some friends that were there. And Andy C was playing. And it was like Andy C with P Money MCing over it. And it was when the dubstep thing was kicking off, like, you know, when Skrillex popped up. When around that time where it got like mainstream for a bit. And I think they were playing uh like make it bond them or something by Skrillex. And I was like, I remember just going into the crowd and people going crazy around me. And I was just like, Oh, I don't even know how to describe the feeling I got. I was like, <laughs> I, was like I felt like I never want to leave this tent. Um, how, how old were you at, at this point in time? I was 10 years old. <laughs> Holy I was shit. literally a child. And Damn, was did like, you go with your parents or something or? Yeah. But I just left them and cool. wandered off. And then like, nice. <laughs> I think, Eventually, my dad was like, where's he gone? And he came in, like, pushed a, shoved a bunch of people out of the way. He's like, you're leaving now. There's people doing drugs here. But, yeah, that's kind of where it but, kicked but off But, Dad, it's, it's dubstep. Yeah. And then after that, kind of, it was either, I think it was after that weekend, I just begged my parents for a laptop so I could get GarageBand. <laughs> so I started on GarageBand and just started making, like, the worst possible songs, but. I didn't care. You were inspired. That's the important part. I I, kind of miss like back in the day when you just didn't care if your song was good or bad and you just make stuff. But yeah, I just obsessed over it from then onwards. Like was producing after school for hours. There's something that you just said that the back in the day when you didn't care about putting out music, obviously now that you have a name for yourself and you have a brand and you, you know, you're trying to, you know, make this, you know, trying to find success and make this in your career and everything. At what point did did you feel not that you're you're in competition with other people, but you know, for people's attentions and stuff, you kind of are in a competition with everyone else who produces music. When did you kind of feel like that started where you actually did kind of start caring about the music that you were putting out and you kind of felt a little bit more of that pressure? Honestly, not until like maybe a year ago. <laughs> like uh, maybe no, that's an exaggeration. Maybe like 2021, because I I never had like any intention of being big or anything, and I still don't see myself as like a known name. But I have always just produced for fun and because it's fun. I'll hear something on SoundCloud and be like, "This sounds insane. I want to try and make something like it," and then I'll try and make it and fail. And that's still pretty much my process today. And yeah, I think 2021, I randomly messaged, you know, obviously, you know, Marauder. So I've known him since like 2015 before he had like any music out. <laughs> but I didn't, I haven't spoken to him that much back, over back the years. When he like, was what? Mast- Mastodon, Mastodon probably? Yeah, when, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, we've like on and off spoken over the years we've known each other because obviously I haven't been back in the day, I wasn't that involved in the scene and he, exploded and turned into a celebrity but i messaged him on a like random occasion because he started his label malignant in 2020 or 2019 i think and then in 2021 i was like after lockdown i'd made a load of music and i just sent him a like couple songs and i was like i don't remember what i said i think i just sent him songs i don't think i had the intention of releasing them and at at that point you you had already had contact and you already like built a relationship yeah like back in the day we used to just like spam each other on skype nice but (laughs) man shout out yeah uh, skype Skype. i haven't used that shit in a while (laughs) those were like the happiest times of my life on skype (laughs) after school but yeah i sent it to him and he was like yeah we will release this and uh yeah i this one song called yo yes which I called it that as a joke. Like I just didn't know what to call it. So I saved it as that. And then I sent it to him without having a name. And he, I just was like, I'll just keep it as that. And that released. And then it was like, that song was crazy. From my perspective, that song was like, oh my God, I'm blowing up. It isn't, but it was like, to me it was at that, at the time. Um, I think still it's like the most streamed song on that compilation it dropped on 
other than the Marauder song that's on there, which is mad because I think that song's terrible. But yeah, that kind of happened. And then I was like, oh, I need to ride this wave of like growth I've got. And I just started releasing way more consistently and putting more, started caring about what my stuff sounded like. And now I'm at the point where I have a mental breakdown every month that my songs suck. <laughs> but yeah. That imposter syndrome of kicks in of, yeah. am I really good enough to be making this what kind of wave? Yeah. I was listening to the Jaquie episode you did because I've, yeah, yeah. I've spoken to him a lot as well. And uh, yeah, the thing you guys talked about with imposter syndrome, I can relate to so much. It's the bane of my life. Yeah. Uh, I've, I think it's a bane of a lot of our lives in this industry too. I think anyone creative right. gets it terribly. Yeah. yeah. Cause then you're, it's always, you know, there's always going to be someone bigger and better than you. And you're like, there's no way I'm in the same ballpark as these people. And you can, that's a, what we were talking about earlier. A big reason why I have this podcast is it's kind of like humanizes everyone. And I try and bring everyone kind of on the same level. Just like, Hey, we're just people at the end. We're all just people. No matter if you're huge, no matter if you're, you know, just starting out, no matter what different position you are in the industry, we're all just people at the end of the day. So I think I'm super disconnected from like what I think people actually like about my music. <laughs> like if I ask someone, I've never asked someone this cause I don't want to sound like a, egotistical prick but I've, if I ask someone like what do you like about my music I, I, I don't know what they'd even say so I don't even know what to kind of I don't know how to say it I don't know what to focus on when producing because I kind of just make stuff that I, I, I don't even have a goal in mind when I produce I just play around with FL until I have like a cool loop and then I'll just make it sound as like big as possible and then make variations of it but so, I think a lot of the the general population too doesn't really n even know how to put in. There's like, oh, he he makes heavy music. I think that's what I like most about it. It's like, okay, yeah, but there's like a million people who makes heavy, who make heavy music. So usually when you ask like just like the general fan, it's hard for them to give you like a precise, I guess, answer of what or like more of an answer that you're looking for. So yeah. it's hard to pinpoint. <laughs> there's also I think one thing that I really struggle with is uh, there's probably like five producers that make the style of dubstep that I do. I mean, there's not, there's loads of them, but in terms of, there's like loads of tear out artists. There's loads of them now, but in terms of the kind of non <laughs> sub distorted type, seems like everyone makes that where it's like just distorted subs. I, I think that's, I'm not a particularly big fan of that style. And I think that's what I really like about, your your style of music personally is that it's not like a lot of those songs like even even if it's the same producer i find that a lot of those type of artists with the you know what you just explained a lot of their stuff sounds very similar the newer kind of new generation of like all these new tear out, tear out artists that have come up they kind of find a formula and then they just stick with it and this is another thing that kind of gives me like horrendous imposter syndrome is every time i make a new song i'm like okay it has to be different from all my other songs <laughs> I'm like, I have to make it sound like I, I am guilty of like using like the same drums or stuff, but I'm like, I'm everyone does that though. Everything. Yeah. I'm going to try to do something that's completely different. But if you listen to my music, you probably wouldn't think that you'd be like, I just, all these songs sound the same, but that's, that's, <laughs> that's kind of what I go through when I'm making a new song. And then when I do try something new, I'm like, Oh, who the fuck do I think I am trying this? <laughs> that's not, that's not Nimna. <laughs> and then I'll like delete it. <laughs> I, I yeah. think, yeah, I, I definitely see where you're coming. I'm not a producer. I don't, I don't produce, but I, you know, I, I manage some artists and stuff. And I think that's exactly, yeah, you find this like signature sound and like I'll use Subtronics for a prime example, like the, the little like twinkly shit that he puts in his music. Or I don't even know what to call that, but like that would be an example of someone's signature sound, but that he makes so many different sounding tracks around that, you know, that sample section or selection or around that type of, you know, signature type of sound or even like producer tags too it's a good way to stand out like uh g-rex he has the horse in his music so there's there's a bunch of different ways that you can kind of i think it's good to make your song sound different <laughs> yeah i think it's good to find a signature sound if you want to call it that that isn't like super what am i trying to say like try and find the element in your music that you want to be your signature sound make it something that isn't like super obvious because then 
everyone's going to be like, oh, he's done that again. <laughs> like, I don't even know what mine is. I think my signature sound is like just the way I mix stuff, I guess. It's like when people, like going back up to the thing earlier, when people just like distort their low end in every song and it like makes all the basses sound the same. There are some people that pull that off really well, uh, but it's like a lot of people are doing it now. So it's like, yeah, when do you, when, when do you, surely you run out of ideas at some point. Like how many patterns can I make of? <laughs> like, <laughs> or like the videos that are, that are like making, I've seen a couple of reels. I forget who even did it, but they're imitating a DJ and it's like the build up for a drop and then they played another build up and then they oh, played yeah. another build up and then they played another yeah, build up. Yeah, the, the fake out <laughs> meme. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, going back on what I said, like there are, like I said, there's some people that pull it off really well and manage to do some super original stuff with it. Like YVM3 is exploding and he's like done it super well. Another producer is, oh, I don't even know if he's producing anymore, but Chronomical was like one of my favorite ones. Yeah, he's like, He's like some 15 year old kid on like, I think he produces on like a, like a 200 pound laptop and he's like unbelievably good at music. And I'm like, damn, this is not unfair. <laughs> <laughs> some people just have that knack for it, man. Yeah. I wanted to ask being that you're not from the States when I talk to a lot of people who are from the United States and you mm. know, the, the, they're different places for one, but what other like differences have you seen? For, have you played a show in the United States? No, never. No. Okay. I've never even been. Oh, okay. So yeah. then this might not be a great answer to ask you or great question to ask you, but what do you, from what you know about the United States, what would you say is like a major couple, or couple of the major differences between like the scene in the U- UK versus the scene in the US? So there's a huge difference because obviously one, I was talking to someone at, uh, I have a rampage or base paradise about this. I've forgotten who, whoever it was. If you're listening, I'm sorry. I was probably wasted, but we were saying how like in America, there's like shows on every weekend, like every weekend in the UK, in the UK, there's probably like a dubstep show twice a year. <laughs> like, so in the UK, it's just like drum and bass and house. So the way drum and bass is in the UK is how dubstep is in America. Like every weekend, every on weeknights, you could go out and find a club that's got a drum and bass night on or a house night on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas it's like even the older generation, I think that's a big difference too. In the United States, like our parents don't, some people's parents listen to EDM, but most depending on their age bracket. But like my parents, my our generation, our most of our parents like do not even like like even house music, like basic EDM music. Yeah, I, I think the whole age gap things. It's like that everywhere. Europe's a bit better. Like I wouldn't say it's like anywhere near like it is in the US, having events on like every weekend, but it's a, a lot more. Uh, regular there. Australia's pretty good. I've played there once this year, which was like insane. Aussies go off, man. Yeah, they, they love it. <laughs> They're rowdy. They absolutely <laughs> love it. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's the main difference is just it's not big anywhere compared to how it is in the US. Uh, hopefully I'll be there next year. Like we're going to try and do the visa thing at the end of the year. Sweet. Awesome. Well, hopefully we get you out here because I'd love to attend one of your shows. I apologize in advance. <laughs> yeah. Uh, kind of going going past this and talking more on like you being from the UK. How did the collaboration with Kaiwachi? Because I know you just released a collaboration with Kaiwachi. He he did on his last album. You and then also we had Prosecute on you. You guys were the only two that did collabs with him recently. How did that opportunity happen? Especially you know you not being from the US. So. Kai has followed me like on SoundCloud and everything since like 2017. Um, and like we'd never spoken and he just like, like all my stuff on SoundCloud and he always has since then. And then I think I started talking to him in either 2019 or 2020 and we just started chatting. Like we literally just became friends, started talking about like the gym and stuff. And then when I met started. him, that's what our conversation was too. <laughs> <laughs> that's usually how it goes, yeah. And then eventually we started like sending each other music. Like he'd send me stuff and ask for feedback. I'd send him stuff and ask for feedback. And then he started like playing my stuff out a lot. And then I think one day I just sent him like this work in progress song. And I was like, do you want to like make this into a collab? And this was back again, like 
this is when I didn't care about Nimda. I was like, oh, it'd be funny. We should just make a song. And little did I know, two years later, he would finish it <laughs> and release it. Like, yeah, it was kind of like l- pure luck because it was like a whip that we, I didn't think we'd ever finish. And then, yeah, two years later, he finishes the song and puts it out. And I was like, wow. Craziness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What effect have you noticed that has had on your career as an uh, artist? Uh, like it's kind of been a long term thing because he, not he, he only finished it this year, but he's always played like the not finished version out and always tagged me in like his story and stuff when he plays it and made posts of him playing it and tagging me. And it's like slowly, it's been like two just years like, of just slowly pushing yeah. your name and stuff to his art. That's dope. He's slowly just like supported me bit by bit over the last couple of years. I can't thank that guy enough, honestly. I, I really hope I meet him one day. He's like so supportive. Uh, we've had like so many Discord calls where we'll kind of just like chat about what we're struggling with in music and he'll be like, like my low-key therapist sometimes would be like, you can't think like that. You need to think like this. Uh, and then he'll send me his music and be like, oh, I think this bit sucks. And I'll be like, no, it's not doesn't suck and then yeah he's great that's awesome Um, yeah i I would imagine that working with someone like kai who has years of professional experience would probably teach you a lot too being in your position yeah Yeah, yes like what were some of the biggest takeaways do you think from working and knowing and building that relationship with kai i think that song is just it's just i I was when it first got worked on like 2020 2021 2021 we, I was like one of my favorite songs I'd made and it was one of the first songs I'd put online that people were like, oh, this is actually sick. I, I think I put it in a showcase in like 2021 and everyone was like, what? Nimda and Kai watch it. And that kind of just generated a lot of hype. Yeah, the, the overall takeaway is just, it's just built like a lot of gas <laughs> over the whole project, which is nice. Definitely nice. Um. Yeah, I can't thank Kai enough, honestly. Uh, if you told like, sorry, if you told like a uh, twelve-year-old me that I'd have a song not only with him but on Cannibalin Records, I was like, "What? <laughs> Nimda on Cannibalin <laughs> Records? Like, a, I don't even know what you'd class them as. Like, they kind of do every genre." But yeah, yeah, I mean, it's BTSM's label. They definitely have. Yeah, yeah, they do have a lot of different stuff that they like: glitch hop, heavy dubstep, tear out. Like, they do they definitely do a lot of different things. Two things that I wanted to mention was one is I bet it was probably a cool experience working with someone like Kai who has again years of experience professionally and learning or seeing that even he doesn't have everything figured out even he still struggles with things even he you know at that level you would think oh they have it all figured out it's a walk in the park now because they've done it all no and it's like that's so far from the truth I think it gets harder as you get yeah. as you get bigger yeah honestly you have bigger problems like, yeah <laughs> yeah the bigger you get the more struggles you face and also the better you get at music like the more you start hating your own stuff because <laughs> you just notice more and more wrong with it and you think okay if I'm this good surely I can make something better than what i'm making like it's it's a it's like a constant cycle of okay you get better producing and you're like oh then you realize more that you suck <laughs> yeah and you realize oh in that song i just had to do that to fix that problem so now i can fix it and then you can't and then you <laughs> do it again <laughs> like and then you yeah you know it's another problem repeat. it's like yeah <laughs> well i wanted to switch gears here and talk a little bit more about a, a sensitive subject and something that you've experienced that I, again, doing my research, found out about a few years back. I I don't actually know exactly when this happened, but you lost one of your best friends to suicide. And I wanted to ask just kind of how, how that experience was, I'm sure rough, but what were some of the, you know, tools and stuff that you've learned and that you do for your mental health, not only through that, but also past that. And how did that experience kind of shape the way you looked at mental health? I think dealing with something like that, there's no kind of handbook guide to it. Um, Can you just walk, before you get into answering those questions, can you just walk us through kind of how that experience kind of unfolded for you, if you can talk about it? Yeah, I can talk about it. Okay. So, I mean, Sam was like my best friend 
since we were like four or five years old. And he, we went to school together and then he went to like a different school and we stayed in contact and yeah, we've always been friends. And then, yeah, he was like, not a lot of people understood him. He was like super, just that guy who was like super loud and had no filter. He would just like say <laughs> the stupidest things and it would either make everyone cry with laughter or really pissed off. And it was great. Yeah. Um, he was a polarizing person, which is dope. <laughs> yeah, and I've always said like he was one of the few people who like understood me, and I was one of the few people who understood him. But yeah, I, I mean, without going into crazy detail, like one day I just found out, like my mum just came in in tears and just told me what had happened, and I think I probably just stared at a wall for like six hours. <laughs> Yeah, and then in shock that I, your I went, friend passed. Yeah, I, I went to my friend's house, and yeah, I, I mean, like we went, like we were saying, like there's no kind of real guide to dealing with something like that. I I didn't really process it until maybe like last year, and I think just kind of it sounds cliche as hell, but just looking after yourself and staying around friends, and when you do feel like you can talk about it, uh, kind of even if it means just saying what happened or if it means talking about that person or talking about what happened, that does help you process it in your head, just saying it. Uh, it kind of becomes real when you say it. So it, it's horrible, but it's kind of little stepping stones towards becoming, accepting it, you know? It's, it's a horrible thing to go through, but it's, and like, you'll always think about that person. You'll never kind of fully get past it, but it becomes manageable. So, and yeah, and you can do what I did and use a fucking voice note of him saying Nimda in every single song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> cool. I didn't realize you did that. Yeah, like my producer tag is him. So that's so cool. Way to, that's a great way to, you know, keep someone's energy and spirit alive yeah it's that, like a that's super, so cool that you do that it's like a super stupid joke voice note as well that i just happened <laughs> to have from him like from 2017 or something but yeah just honestly just let people look after you that's the best thing i could say yeah yeah if, if you could if you could talk to him right now and you had one thing that you were able to say to him what would you what would that one thing be uh i thought about this a lot uh because it's like when we'd hang out the first thing we say to each other is like Oh, just like, how, like, what have you been up to? But if if he like suddenly magically appeared, I'd probably just be like, you know, I've played your stupid voice note to like a crowd of like five k people. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably say that, and I'd probably show him all the stupid like drill remixes I've made because he loved drill. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'd tell him he's a fucking idiot. Um, <laughs> that's probably about it <laughs> was there any piece of that that you hopefully not now but in the early phases did you put any blame on yourself of like why that happened because you were so close to him yeah there's always that aspect I think no matter how close you are to someone there's always that, that aspect but that was probably one of the hardest parts for me because it's like I saw him two days before he did it and we like went to like a pub and had a drink and he was like absolutely fine like wouldn't have been able to tell anything was wrong. So it's like the, the, the main thing that played on my mind a lot in the first two years was just like, Oh, if I just messaged him that day, like things could have been different, but that, that's probably, but there's, you have no control over that. Like it. And yeah, there's no point kind of trying to wonder what could have happened because like it's happened as blunt as that sounds like you can't, you can't, it's a waste of time to get hung up on stuff like that. But all, all you can do is like not learn from it, but I mean, you do learn from it. That's the thing. Absolutely. You, you learn to check on people more. Yeah. Um, do you think going through that experience has made you a better friend to the friends that you still do have? I like to think so. Yeah. I definitely like to think so. But yeah, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I hope I am. How did that experience 
affect your mental health? And going back to our previous, my previous questions, how did that affect your mental health? And what kind of, you know, mechanisms have you adopted to not only get through that experience, but also, you know, that you carry into today to keep your mental health in check? I'm a super like autonomous person. I'm like, okay, uh, this is how I think when I'm in this situation. But I think it definitely made me, this is kind of cliche as hell, but it definitely made me think, okay, every day you live, you could, it could literally be your last day. So, and same with the people around you, like, you don't know when someone's going to kind of not be in your life anymore. So I try, I definitely make more of an effort now to kind of, it sounds again, super cliche, but like be in the moment a bit more. I really struggle with it because of like being a producer, um, you know, you're so hard in the music industry. You're constantly yeah. working. So I, I really, flies. Yeah. yeah, I really struggle with it, but I definitely make more of an effort to, you know, yeah. and I think that's definitely helped. I also had like therapy for ages and that's something yeah. that yeah. I think works for some people, doesn't work for others, but that definitely Some people have a helped. difficult, it, it, if you're able to open up to, let's be honest, unless you have a relationship with your therapist, but a lot of times people don't have a previous relationship with their therapist. Mm. If you're not able to open up to like, most of the time a complete stranger, then it's really hard to like make therapy effective, I guess. Like you really have to, you have to be willing to share that and be willing to accept the help from someone that you don't have a whole lot of trust in that you don't really know. Like you do have trust in them because they're professionals, but I can see where people would, would struggle with therapy or why therapy would not work for them. So that's awesome Mm. that it has worked for you. (laughs) It's also, it's just like a stranger so yeah exactly yeah um but i think finding the right one is important like don't just try it once and be like oh this person sucks i'm not gonna do it again i think i went through like four different ones <laughs> but yeah that that definitely helps me kind of generate a better understanding of like uh, again this is kind of what therapy does for everyone it definitely helped me just understand why i was thinking certain things and feeling certain ways about it but yeah that's all i could really suggest yeah and and the big thing that personally that i do and that i know you're also interested in because we brought it up earlier with talking about kaiwachi Mm. is the gym the gym is a huge mental health thing for me yeah that's been a crazy savior of mine oh (laughs) i'm not anymore yeah because this all happened in 2020 and it was like yeah 2020 was the worst year of my life by a million miles because it was like I lost Sam and then we had lockdown a month later. And then what timing? You're just like going through yeah. grieving and you can't even go out and do anything. You're like, and stay in your house and grieve. I remember just thinking, like, oh, if, if Sam was here, he would just be taking the piss out of this. He'd be like going into shops and pretending to cough and stuff. <laughs> and like, but yeah, lockdown and then I couldn't go to the gym anymore. Uh, Nimda was like, not really a thing at 20 in 2020. Like I I've had the Nimda project since like 2014 or something, but it's been super on and off. And then, yeah, my dog died. Uh, my mom got ill. It was like horrendous, but I actually built like a wooden squat rack in my garden and just bought like some really shit weights and just Prison did workouts, what I could. Go. Literally did like, <laughs> did like, Workouts that would take an hour in a normal gym, they took me like three hours because I'd be putting everything oh, together every day. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was long. But that's, yeah, that's always been a huge kind of thing that's kept me sane. Why do you think mental health is so important for people who are in the music industry? I tell you, I think it's because it's just, being a musician is, oh, I'd be real, being a musician is so bad for you. <laughs> like, your mental health is going to, you're going to suffer if you're like a musician and you're in it for the long run because so you do have to work like extra hard to kind of keep on top of it you can't just fall into like self-destructive habits or anything because like things can get really hard like you're putting your thing your song that you worked hours on in front of an audience and you have no idea what they're gonna think or do yeah or say you're open yourself wide open yeah hundreds of thousands of people and judging you the yeah <laughs> like like i said at the start the bigger you get the harder that gets like the honestly the every year the anxiety i get when i've 
release a song, like the day I have to post it is horrendous and it gets worse every year. And it's like, is this song going to completely flop? Is it going to blow up? Like, I have no idea ever which ones are going to do well, which ones aren't. And you just got to keep putting shit out and hopefully they, one or two of them do something. Yeah, I think what's important yeah. is to just keep it really clear in your head, like what your goal is and why you're doing it. Because when you forget that, that's when it gets really messy. Like when you forget why you love producing and when it doesn't become fun anymore, that's when you can fall into a pretty shit place. I've, I've been there like a bunch of times where I've burnt myself out so much that I'm like, oh, producing isn't even fun anymore. And then I'm like, well, what else do I have in my life? <laughs> yeah. Like, other than training. Gym and music. That's yeah. It. <laughs> pretty much. So I think, yeah, taking regular breaks. Uh, one thing that has been a game changer for me is I've got like Instagram and Twitter and everything, all the notifications and that are turned off. So I don't that's get That's so smart. Like, that's a huge that, that's thing. That's a huge game changer. Because if you go yeah. into like the, your account settings, you can turn off like notifications of everything apart from messages so that you only get a notification when someone like you know messages you, which is a huge thing. Because I, I try not to even go on like my timeline and look at stuff because I'll just end up sp- spending hours on it. But, Dude, yeah. Doom scrolling is the devil, man. <laughs> it sucks. I hate doom. And you get stuck doing it and you're like, I'm just going to hop on Instagram because I'm like trying to kill a couple minutes or whatever. And then it's like, you look up and you're like, holy shit, it's been an hour already. I was going on for five minutes. I wasted time. <laughs> yeah. And there's also, obviously, there's also a lot of pressure to stay consistent and active on yeah. socials. I have heard something from a mentor of mine. Uh, shout out Nick Truink. Used to work for Icon. He said, I forget how he even phrased this, but he basically said like, focus more of your time. You know, everyone's got to use social media, especially in today's day and age, especially, you know, as an artist, you're, you're a business owner as well. And the marketing, all that stuff, you, you need to use it, but focus more on putting out content rather than consuming content. If that makes sense. So like focus more on like putting things out for other people to enjoy than like doom scrolling and getting stuck on the app. Yeah. So, I'm definitely kind of really glad that I kind of have always had that approach. Yeah. <clears throat> Way healthier. <laughs> yeah. I, I unfollow, like, I, this is probably one of my biggest, uh, I get a lot of, like, hate for this sometimes. <laughs> I, like, unfollow people all the time. Like, not, like, people I'm friends with or, like, artists I listen to, but I'll, like, follow someone at, I'll follow someone that I, like, hung out with once. Like, I met them when I was yeah. in, like uh, a show or something just trying to be a good and person then, to them like, or show them a good you know yeah, yeah I won't like forget who they are but then they'll like come off my timeline and I'm like I don't care I don't know you <laughs> yeah. I, I spent yeah. like I spent like three hours with you <laughs> yep and I'm like yeah. I, I just I just three years later and you're like I met you one time I don't care <laughs> yeah and then sometimes like they'll message me and they'll be like oh why'd you unfollow me and I'm like oh I didn't mean to <laughs> yeah right but, <laughs> Yeah. You see, I don't. I don't know if you if this sports even a big thing over there, but I've recently really gotten into watching UFC. Oh, really? And Same. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know I, Sean Sean O'Malley. He no, one. This is the thing. I, I'm really bad at like remembering fighters' okay. names, but probably Sean O'Malley. He just won the belt on Saturday for Bantamweight. Oh yeah. I, I was at my friend's house and he was talking about that. Yeah, uh, you go on his Instagram, he has, I don't even know, probably a couple million, I, I would imagine, followers. He's, he follows zero people. Like, what? <laughs> a lot of people do that. Uh, yeah. I think it's like... Like, what uh, does your timeline even look like? It's just ads and shit, or what? It's probably just ads and, like, the for you yeah. page, yeah. I mean, I think, I think some people do that for, like, you know, branding. It looks cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when you're at that level, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd probably do the same if I was like, had like a million followers. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Someday, man. Someday. I don't think any dub suffice has a million followers. <sighs> other than like, uh, no, house and Darman based people do, but yeah. I don't think anyone in, even Dixision only has like half a mil or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But. Well, awesome, man. We are getting kind of close to time. I like to keep these within the hour, but it's been awesome talking to you before we, you kind of wrap up here. I wanted to ask kind of what's coming up for you and you, you know, what are some plans for not only the rest of this year, but into next and kind of where you, where you want to see your project go in the near future? Uh, well, for now I'm just going to keep dropping songs. 
I've just dropped a showcase. So now I've got 19 songs to, that people keep asking me to release. And it's like, I've only just dropped the showcase. But I'm going to keep dropping them. Uh, a US visa is going to be applied for at the end of this Sweet. year. And then I guess Hopefully the that goes that, through. It goes through just, smoothly for you because I know sometimes those take forever. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out my manager. He's done bits for me for that. Been helping me with that a lot. But yeah, then hopefully the plan next year is just play loads of shows. <laughs> Get you in the US um, touring circuit, man. Yeah. That's it. You're, you're right there. I think, I think you're, we'll see you start. If that, if that goes through and everything goes right, we'll definitely start seeing you pop up on more lineups. Yeah, hopefully. Awesome, man. Well, uh, where can listeners find you and keep up to date on everything you got coming up? Uh, I am on all socials, nimda underscore UK. Uh, apart from Facebook, nimda UK. No underscore. Facebook don't let you put underscores because it's tapped. But, um, Spotify, Nimda, Apple Music, Nimda, SoundCloud, Nimda. Make sure and yeah. link that all, all in the description as well. I'll go ahead and link your showcase too. I want to go listen to that when we're done. Legit. But yeah. Uh, final question. You've heard this a, probably a thousand times listening to our, our uh, interviews, but if there was one piece of advice you could give yourself when you first picked a, picked up a doll and started making music, what would Get it be? Get OTT. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, don't think I, I don't think I started using OTT until like 2020. Damn. Which is so embarrassing. Yeah. That's like I was living under now. a rock. <laughs> but, yeah. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on, telling us your story and being also open about, you know, your experience with mental health and that big, big traumatic event of your friend and just, just being so open and being willing to communicate that not only to our, our audience, but to me and just being so comfortable uh, opening up about it. I, I really appreciate it. So I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. Have a good day. Better sit, you too.